I am happy to have Eve Molson with me again today. She is the owner of Fun for Pets. It's a doggy daycare and boarding in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Thank you for joining me. Well, thanks for having me again. This is a highlight of my month for sure. Oh, good. It's fun to have you because you have such a vast amount of information to be able to share with us. And your experience is different than mine. So I think it, I think it pairs well. Absolutely. You know, it's, we don't know what we don't know. And so education for everybody is super important. Certainly. And in in yours being a little bit a different experience than mine, uh, you have the doggy daycare and I, and I admit that I still go and uh, watch the videos on Facebook quite often. And is it as fun as it seems? It is, you know, it's really hard to be in a bad mood all day. It is, you know, you might start out in a bad mood because you spilled your coffee on your lap on your way into work or running late or what have you, but um, watching the dogs interact with each other and engage with each other, it gives you those warm fuzzies. So yeah, it's, it's stressful and a stress reliever simultaneously built in. <laughs> yeah. Cause you're running your own business, but having their pets there, it just looks like a blast. And I'm glad to know that most of the time it is. It is. It is. Yeah. When uh, people ask me what I do for a living, I usually just tell them I clean up poop. Um, (laughs) And then they stare at me for a minute or two and I go, I run a dog daycare. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, yeah, you do. (laughs) Yeah. I usually start with the poop comment just to gauge whether or not they're a dog person. And so this week, you know, we're going to talk about a number of things. I'm going to update you on Violet. We're going to talk about kitten season. And then with the summer holidays coming up, because lost pets become a part of that. Absolutely. Uh, 4th of July is the number one day of lost pets. Yeah. And, you know, Violet, she was my barker. We talked about her last time and, and we've been bonding using the scatter feeding and the hand feeding. And I tried to find it as we've been walking outside. We've been doing a little bit of that training. And, you know, up until last Friday, I was going to say, oh my gosh, it's, she's been amazing. Cause Thursday we had we had the almost perfect walk. We, we walked by people, uh, you know, people we hadn't seen before. There were mowers in the neighborhood. People oh, yes, doing that the time of year, time of year. Yeah. They were awesome. Barely a peep out of her, barely a peep. And then Friday, and this is a good thing too. I told you when we were first talking, I needed to get a handle on her barking as we were out walking. We ran across the man and his two dogs walking. Oh, and both of the dogs lost it. <laughs> they, yeah. they were barking. They were crazy. And Millie was trying to lunge across the street. And I'm like, oh, you were so perfect yesterday. So we had a little bit of a setback. I had my cookies in my pocket. And I, Beautiful. you know, put them to the ground. And, and for a half a second, they thought, oh, yeah. And then, bam, they went back to that barking. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's it's really has improved things. It's improved things so much. Nice, nice. And you know, you will have those setbacks. And the biggest piece of advice I usually give people is get through it and then take a breath. Otherwise you're holding that. um, And that will transfer then the rest of the walk. Our dogs are not robots. We're not robots, right? Like people and things, somebody cuts in front of you while you're driving (laughs) that sets you off, right? Like you say some choice words you're irritated. You are not a saint all the time. So there will be those situations where your dog is going to forget, or that other dog is just really giving them the stare down and they need to do the stare down back. And you give it, you have to give them a little grace. You have to give them a little grace. And the key is how do you do that effectively and efficiently and safely? And that's where, you know, they're lunging a bark and you say, let's go. And you just walk a little faster and keep your butt moving. And, you know, and when I realized the cookies weren't going to work, that's kind of what I did. And then we got to the place where there's picnic tables and benches and we just kind of sat there and chilled for a few minutes because yeah, I needed Collect as yourself. much as they Collect did. yourself. Yeah. Absolutely. It's just as stressful for you as it is for them. And so then here the two of you are just given all this vibe and energy of, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. What's uh-huh. next? Is there going to be another one? I don't know. What do you think? So yeah, you, you just got to give yourself a little grace, take in some breaths, reground yourself, and then remember you're just walking a dog. It truly, it, it's worked and it's worked well. And, and 
I'm not sure what was going on with Millie, my golden, but you know, Violet, I think she's, I think she's just a little nervous. I think she has just a touch of anxiety, um, you know, from times. And I don't think her barking is because I paid attention, you know, kind of like, you know, when we were talking last time, like you said to do, and I've, I've paid attention to her and I think it's just a touch of anxiety. Mm-hmm. and uh you know so we're working on that and like you said it, you know there's going to be some setbacks and uh i i kind of changed the direction and we kept on going and and so it you know it's it's a it's a work in progress but it's a very good work in progress that's beautiful beautiful yeah i was working with a client this weekend uh their dog had had a play date and it got out of hand and the dog bit the play date dog and police were involved and now the dog has a bite record And so I had to muzzle train this nine-year-old dog. And what I noticed is inside, muzzle could be on, muzzle could be off, could walk past a whole bunch of dogs in kennels, completely calm. The minute we went outside, pure anxiety. Something about being outside caused this dog anxiety. Didn't matter, muzzle on, muzzle off, just sitting on a bench out, just being outside of of four walls gave this dog anxiety. And I know that there's a whole lot of reasons dogs can have anxiety. It could, I was wondering, uh, you know, it was the same man and his two dogs walking by. Could there be some pheromones going on that just, you know, catches my dog, my, my big Millie off, makes her off guard? Oh, absolutely. Um, So dogs, before they bark, they're posturing. They're giving you the stare down, the evil eye. You know, they might be puffing up their chest a little bit. And these are things that we're, we're not the best at reading because yeah. we're not a dog. And if you think about dogs are at the same eye level. Um, you know, I mean, humans, we're up and down, whatever, but like eye contact. So that dog might be giving your Millie the, hey, hey, hey my daddy's better than your mommy conversation before the barking and erupting even comes into play. And absolutely, I mean, they sense our energy, they sense the energy of the ground, they can sense when thunderstorms are coming. So there's definitely uh, an aura and a vibe that your dog could be picking up on way before the vocalization even happens. The vocalization is the premise before, in theory, before the fight. It's the smack talk. Oh, I'm going to take you down. No, you're not. Yes, I am. You know, that conversation is transpiring yeah. with all this barking going on and the pulling. And, you know, it's, it's the fronting before the fight. And so yeah. there's a lot that transpires before that even happens. And that's in the body language of the dog. You know, again, chest might puff out. Shoulders might get a little stiff. The back legs might come out a little bit, like waiting for the pounce the direct eye contact, there might be a little sneering that we're not seeing in the mouth area. So see, they agree with me. (laughs) She does. This is happening. She's like, that's it. That's it, mom. That's it. That's what's happening. He's Um, telling you everything I'm feeling. (laughs) So a a lot of that transpires because people be like, oh, I thought I was doing so good. My dog was walking past really good. And then all of a sudden, right when we're within a foot, my dog lost it. Well, sure. There was a whole lot of posturing. Again, those dogs are eye to eye with each other and they have nothing else they can do other than stare at each other because they're attached to a leash, which is attached to the human. And us humans are making eye contact because we're trying to be polite to where the dogs are. (laughs) The dogs dogs are, are, you know, jousting to see who is, is in charge of this walk by communication. Yeah. Um, and that's where that find it comes into play because then it causes the dog to look down. It alleviates that visual tension that's going on between the two dogs during the walk. It is about me. It's about, I don't see that going on because I wasn't paying attention. I was, I was, I had a fabulous walk the day before I was living in that walk that was the day before, not the one that was happening. Sure. Sure. And it's, it's hard when you are outside. Mm-hmm to pay attention to everything going on around you. Definitely. And so I, it's just good to, to hear what you're saying about that. I kind of, I kind of thought that, you know, there, there would be those times. I kind of know that from my years of dog walking and I let my guard down with my dogs much more than I do with anybody else's dog. 
Yeah. And give yourself grace for that. Just yeah. Treat Your dog gets some grace for that. You get some grace for that. Again, we, none of us are hundred percent perfect. We're going to, we're going to lose our cool from time to time. Three weeks ago, as uh, I told you, we, we adopted a little kitten. And uh, when we adopted the kitten and we were driving the kitten home, I was thinking, what would Eve do? What would Eve say? (laughs) What would Eve say how to introduce a new little fur baby family member into the family? And I'll tell you what I did. And you can tell me how well I did or didn't do. Sounds good. Millie's the older dog. And I was expecting trouble with her. Mm -hmm. Violet's the younger shy dog. I knew that she had maybe a little bit of anxiety. They've both been around cats. They were both raised by kitties, I like to say. And they've since passed. And we brought the new one home. And she was crazy tiny. I mean, really super duper 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 tiny. So we got home, put the dogs out the back, brought the kitty in, brought her upstairs to what it's going to be her area where we could close the door if we had to. Got her settled, got her box ready, got her just a little bit of chow. Because I, I, she came from a sketchy background you know we we adopted her because of that because she's young uh and then we brought the dogs in I had the kitten in my arms and Millie was like in love Violet was a little shy sure and then we went and sat on the couch a little bit of sniffing and I would say since then Millie's in love Violet's a little still a little wary because there are sharp sharp claws on on the end of those paws. Yes, there are. And, and I was thinking, oh, I don't know if I did this right. Cause it had been more than a decade since I'd brought a kitten home, like 15 years, uh, since Katrina, that was the last gotcha. time we adopted a kitten. Gotcha. And, uh, so everything's going really, really, really pretty well. And so, but what would the tips you be to give to somebody introducing a new furry family member? Yeah. Um, always making sure everybody is safe. So with a kitten, the kitten doesn't have any preconceived notions of what a dog is. So it's much simpler, truly. And what you did is right, you know, make sure that you had a hold of it or, you know, if you felt uncomfortable holding it, because again, don't give off the sketchy vibes, put it in a carrier and let the dog sniff it, let the cat sniff it and allow the time And that's the key, right? Like you brought it home. You are taking your time. Don't come home and set it down and go, here you go, guys. You like it? This is a timed process. You need to make sure everybody's feeling comfortable. Once the dogs have sniffed the carrier or sniffed the cat, and then they kind of wander off on their own, then you shift to a new area like the couch or a different room and allow the same process to happen. Because these dogs are trying to figure out, well, this thing's allowed everywhere I'm allowed. Yeah. Or is it only going to go over here? You know, they're, again, they're trying to read it with a kitten. The kitten's going to be like, oh, hello, you hairy doofus. What are you doing in my face? <laughs> right? Like, so again, yeah. some preconceived notions. When you have older animals, that's where it gets a little more tricky um, because you may not know the history of the cat or the dog. So if people have cats and they're bringing a dog in or vice versa, I usually recommend they take one of those wire dog crates and you put a cubby for the cat to hide in and you put a litter pan and water in the dog crate and you put the cat in it in the living room. Yeah. This way the cat can't run. So we're not creating this whole chase. Oh my God, it's a squeaky toy that moves <laughs> yep. scenario. And at the same time, we're allowing both of them to utilize their skills of scent, sight, right? So they're taking it all in. The cat can hide. I mean, I'm not going to tell you it's not stressful. It's stressful for everybody, yeah. humans included in this scenario, because you want your family to get along. And you do this for maybe an hour or two. Again, don't let the dog be a jerk and like be banging on the, the kennel. Once everybody seems calm, then dog goes outside. Cat is either allowed to roam or go into their special space. If we're unsure of the whole chasing thing, then the cat needs to go to its special space dog comes back in, the dog can go in and explore the crate, all is good in the world, you do it again. And usually after two weeks of doing this for, you know, a little bit each day, by the end, both animals are fine. The cat can run, the dog's like, oh, that's just the cat, it's not a squeaky toy. But it just takes them time to understand they are different species, 
the species runs, jumps, and purrs, this one forages, goes outside to go potty, not in the box, you know, and that type of thing. So safety is always, always the key. And using that scent, the smell of each other is the most helpful in all of that. And what do you say to those who, you know, they're trying letting the kitty out, they're trying to let them be in the same space. Of course, there may be some hissing, there may be, you know, the dog being, oh my gosh, do you let the cat smack the dog in the face? Absolutely. You let that cat tell that dog that was inappropriate behavior because that is going to go farther than you correcting the dog. The cat is communicating with the dog and this is how they're going to communicate. There, there's no two ways about it. I would always have the dog dragging a leash. So if the dog is getting too rambunctious and you need to pull back, it's just easier to grab a leash than it is to try and grab the collar or grab the dog. I would also, if you have a multiple animal household, I would not put a bell on your cat. Yeah. Because a lot of times that just irritates your dog. <laughs> Especially yes. when your, your, your cat usually wanders the house at night, right? They're nocturnal yeah. and the dog yeah. is trying to sleep. If you want to irritate your dog, by all means, feel free to put a bell on your cat. But um, <laughs> usually I don't recommend that. And uh, yeah, the, the key thing is that scent. So even if you, I mean, you can spread it out and do it even farther. Like if you're like, I don't have a dog crate. I don't want to go buy a dog crate. No problem. So then you just let the cat wander a room for a little bit, and then you put the cat away. Then you let the dog wander the room for a little bit. Then you put the dog away. So you just rotate the room with the various scents until they finally, again, after a week, they'll be like, oh yeah, I smell that cat was in here. And they go lay down. Yeah. Cause I think, you know, after my hurricane Katrina kitty, we used the bathroom for that. You know, there was one bathroom, we could close them off. And that's how we, we negotiated that without a crate. I'm lucky enough this time that they get along so well that I don't need a crate, but she does have her safe place. Beautiful. And then when I leave home, I put her uh, in her room. I, you know, I close the door. She yeah. has everything she needs. And, and, uh, I, and I leave her in there. How long do you recommend probably doing that? I usually tell people, when you come home and you let the cat out of its room, if the dog never goes near the cat, then you're good. Okay. Once the dog shows no interest in that thing that's coming out of the room, then you're good. And that's the key. Yeah. The dog and the cat can live harmoniously. And as long as neither one of them could care less where the other one is and what's going on with it, then you're fine. But yeah, it, and always having that capability. I mean, the cats can climb, they can jump up high. So having spaces within the house where if when you're not home, the dog is barking because the UPS guy's at the door and the cat's freaked out that it still has that safe place to go to. Yes. And is there any type of a household or a dog that just shouldn't have a cat addition? I usually say your terrier breeds. I mean, their whole job is to chase small vermin. Yeah. So it's, yeah. It, it's tough, you know, and you hate to say it by a breed, but their natural tendency is to chase small animals yeah. and snatch them. They're ratters. It, they chase yes. ratters into holes. Yep. Yep. Okay. So whether that's a bull terrier, a rat terrier, um, a Jack terrier. Russell, yeah, your Karen terrier, your Jack <laughs> Russell terriers. Just that terrier yeah. breed, you know, yeah. that that's what they were bred for. So, you know, it's not every breed, it's not every dog in that breed, but it's just, you need to be extra cautious um, with that knowledge base. I think that that's, in, that's important to know. I used to have a blonde Toto and the kitties came before, the, before her. And so in that way, it worked in that household. And one of the cats she was terrified of, they never had a squabble, but she was terrified of that cat. Maybe it's because she go. was always way bigger than her. It's a good to know that. I don't think it's too much overgeneralizing because they are breed for those types of instincts. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, some of your hounds are bred to chase raccoons and bears up a tree. What does a cat do? It runs up the cat tower. <laughs> So, you know, you might have some issues there. 
typically you can train that dog to differentiate between wild game and the cat in your house. But, uh, but yeah, the terriers are, would be the only breed that I would be concerned about. I am always concerned when people have terriers and they're like, oh, I'm going to get a guinea pig. I'm like, safety, 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 safety. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because usually if they have a guinea pig, they have children and right. we don't want the children to experience anything awful that could possibly happen. Correct. Correct. And that's, that's exactly it. I mean, we... With my ex-husband and I, we had hunting hounds and my daughter wanted a small little fluffy dog that she could carry in a purse. Not a good mix. So we ended up with a French bulldog who could hold her own and yeah. tell the hounds where to go. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, she, she wanted a four pound teacup chihuahua, um, long hair. Yeah, sure. And that's what little girls like, of course. And, yeah. and I think, but you did make that uh, conscious choice of getting a dog that could hold their own. Correct. So you have a terrier type breed, but you want a, you want a cat. Should I bring in a trainer to, to help me with assessing whether I could bring in a cat to the house? Yes. Uh, if you're adopting from a shelter or rescue, um, definitely let them know you have a terrier and they can usually f- help facilitate that uh, introduction to see if the cat and the terrier are a good mix. Um, and if they don't, then I would definitely reach out to a trainer that can help facilitate it, at, you know, to set the two of them up to succeed from day one. So do it, you know, Hey, I'm going to go adopt a cat. The shelter rescue doesn't do that. Reach out to a trainer who can help facilitate that. A lot of trainers have extra crates available. They can borrow it to you, um, do weekly check-ins. Uh, I've watched the show where that cat guy's on TV giving you how to train your cat tips. Oh yeah. And yeah. Uh, I love it. But uh, yeah, you just, you, safety is everything. You know, you're going to feel like a horrible human if you set these two up to fail and that it leads to something traumatic. So yeah, yeah definitely. Cause I know I have extra crates, some, but you know, you have somebody's friends or family uh, might have an extra crate cause they can be expensive. And if you're Absolutely. just going to use it for a few weeks, that might not be an expense that you want. And there's all kinds of uh, swaps online nowadays. Oh my gosh. Yes. I was shopping on there earlier. <laughs> yep. And I have the community billboard, which, you know, people put out, I need this. And somebody usually comes to their rescue quite quickly. And uh, speaking of, uh, well, let's just change subjects a little bit here. because You I- hit it. You hit on it. Community <laughs> billboard. Yeah, the community billboard is a big thing and it's a big thing for the summer. And the summer's coming up and there's holidays coming up and things are reopening and we're going to have parties this summer because we can. And so let's talk about that. There's a lot of things that can go on with your pets, cats and dogs. And I'll put that, you know, both in together because we just talked about maybe you have a new kitten from kitten season or maybe you're just adopting someone or maybe in your household you already have both or one. Uh, let's talk about, you know, the subject of that. Cause there's many things, there's many points we can make there. Absolutely. So if you are hosting a party at your home, put your cat in a safe place and put a sign on the door. Cats, although they might like you and get affection from you, there are strange sounds and noises and they might bolt. You know, somebody's like, oh, is this the bathroom and opens the door, doesn't even realize your cat has left the room. You might have the back door open because you have guests coming and going. And then the next day you realize that your cat has now been missing for more than 12 hours. Yeah. Yeah. Because those little guys are super quick and super sleuthy Yeah, that you may not even realize it. And they just wanted to escape what was going on in your home. Uh, People a lot of times have the misconception of, oh, it's a house cat. It would never go outside. If it is scared, it is going to look for an exit to get them just away from whatever is transpiring. So if the noise is coming from your home, it's going to go to the outside door to get away from that noise. And you also don't want one of your guests thinking, oh, the cat can go outside when they've escaped from that room and letting it out. Uh, you don't want those assumptions made and letting them escape. And, and if it be in the summer, the door might be open already. And, uh, yep. and the same thing about dogs. Dogs have many more types of, uh, oh, what's the word? Things that they hear, things that they see that sure. might make them bold, get lost. Yeah. So again, if you're having people over at your home, 
even if your dog is the most social dog, you know, you take it to restaurants and eat outside and those things, a bunch of people in a confined space where you are not next to the dog can make the dog uncomfortable. You have no idea how your guests are going to treat your pet. Yeah. Um, we all have crazy Uncle Bob. Let's just <laughs> name him Uncle Bob. Yeah. Uncle Bob's going to get down on all fours and grab your dog and hug him. And your dog's going to bite him in the face. And now he's got to go to the emergency room. Now your dog has a bite record. All because yeah. Uncle Bob felt it was appropriate to invade your dog's personal space. And what was your dog to do? You know, it's, it, it's an instinct. His options are fight or flee. Yeah. Uncle Bob's got a hold of him. He can't flee. So he's going to bite to let Uncle Bob know, get away from me. I'm uncomfortable. You're going to feel guilty because you weren't there to diffuse the situation. Yeah. Uncle Bob may or may not feel guilty. Now mm -hmm. you've got to take your dog in for three separate checkup appointments to ensure it doesn't have rabies. Your homeowner's insurance might go up. Yeah, for sure. If you are having a gathering, you have to be your dog, your dog and your cat's advocate. Put them away, put a sign on the door, take them to a boarding facility, do a day stay, even for your cats. Uh, so we board cats at my facility and we have a ton of people that will drop their cats off for the day to stay in one of our condos. They're having their walls painted. They're selling their house and doing a walkthrough. Yeah. They're having a kid's birthday party. Yeah. Um, you know, just it's safety and you as the human have to be your pet's advocate. So I, I tell people, I have an extremely social French bulldog, extremely social. She's my demo dog. If I have people over, she goes in her crate, period, end of discussion. And people will, oh, I want your dog to come out. Nope. Because I can't trust you as the humans to do right by my dog. It's that simple. I mean, I have a fenced yard and everything. I can't trust the humans yeah. to make sure my dog stays safe. And that's, and that's not even a negative thing. It's, it's definitely taking that human that you can't trust, their safety. You're putting their Absolutely. safety first. Yep. And I have a cute little 14 oh, pound yeah. French bulldog. You know, everybody <laughs> wants to pick her up and uh -huh. cuddle her. Uh -huh. And she likes that most of the yeah. time. Yeah. You also um, don't want somebody putting that maybe you don't know as well, putting that cute little 14 pounder in their person going. <laughs> yeah. Or just feeding it table food. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, the next day my dog's got diarrhea all over my house and now what's going on with my dog. And maybe I have to take a trip to the vet. Yes. Cause somebody thought it would be smart to feed my dog a pickle and watch the look yeah. on her face. Uh, I mean, you know, yeah. people are dumb. And yeah. so you have yeah. to be your pet's advocate. Yeah. And again, you know, same with the cats, same with the dogs. They leave the gate open. Oh, my dog's never run off before. Yeah. You're going to bet your dog's life on it? Because what's right for somebody else's pet isn't right for yours, most likely. Correct. Correct. Um, and again, with the holidays coming up, mm -hmm. fireworks are going to oh, go off. Yeah. Loud noise, mm -hmm. music, cars. Um, you have to keep your dog in a bubble. Yeah. Um, when the when the fireworks go off and the dog bolts it is in flight mode there yeah. are no amount of cookies that you uh -huh. could throw at that dog <laughs> for sure that are going to stop it from being in flight mode or just yeah. coming to you because you're there and Correct. it doesn't even necessarily have to be uh fireworks it can be a thunderstorm because they sound a lot alike oh absolutely there's a boom and a yeah. vibration yeah um, and the lights and those, and those yep. lights that can scare them. Yeah. So when your dog takes off. <laughs> if they do. Yeah. If they do, um, as my daughter says, you might need a little more training. Um, <laughs> and in that sense, I say train the human. Yeah. Because again, this, this dog is not going to pay attention. You can yell its name. You can do whatever. First thing to do is call for backup. Call your neighbor, call your, call somebody and let them know. Fluffy just took off down the road. They're heading this direction. I'm going to hop in the car and find them. Start driving. Yeah. Your dog can literally run for miles. Start driving. So you got eyes on that dog and you can know which direction while having your friend on speakerphone, 
while your friend is posting to Facebook. Uh huh. Community bulletin boards. I know my community has a bulletin board and it's several of the, uh, the neighborhoods. Yep, absolutely. Um, so you're driving and let's say you lose sight of your dog. Okay, pull over. Then you send out a mass message to all of your friends and neighbors. Picture of the dog, super important. So we yeah. know what we're looking for. Yeah. Don't put your pet's name in there usually. Because Why somebody might that? somebody might decide that they like Fluffy. Uh, and they're just going to take Fluffy and keep Fluffy. Yeah. And they know Fluffy's name. And Fluffy will come yeah. to that name yeah. potentially. Yeah. So I usually say description, collar, color, um, what the dog likes. Loves hot dogs. Throw some out if you see her. Yeah. Loves car rides. Open your car. See if she'll jump in. And your phone number. Then you need to have that friend monitoring Facebook. Because you're driving, yeah. right? Like you pulled yeah. over, you quick made this post, you're, everybody is sharing it. And now you're back driving, circling the block, starting a bigger radius. Hopefully some friends have said, where are you? I, I can meet you. Great. Now I realize not everybody's going to carry a bunch of stuff in their car like I do. Sure. But if you can, I always have a bag of dog treats in my car for when I see that strange dog running down the road. <laughs> yeah. Um, open your, instead of you, if you see Fluffy and Fluffy's panting and just wide eyed and freaked out still, open your car door and see if Fluffy will come jump in the car. Yeah. yeah. When you walk up to your dog, even though it's your dog, you've spent eight years together, the dog is freaked out. Uh huh and may not be ready to take a breath and realize the scope of the situation. Sure. So the more that you can just be patient and ask your dog to come to you and jump in the car or come to you, hopefully you've got a leash in your hand. Yeah. Um, if you have treats, I just, uh, you know, 20 feet away, throw one and wait. If the dog's not moving, you don't move. Be patient. Your dog needs to catch its breath and assess the situation and just make sure that everything's okay before they move. Yeah. Um, now, let's say the worst has happened. You have no idea where Fluffy went. Mm -hmm. That's when your neighborhood groups. So again, you need to do a post, a picture, most recent picture of the dog. And for those of you that have dogs that get groomed, I know that's hard sometimes. Uh -huh. right yep oh yeah. here's when they were fluffy but they're shaved now Crap. yeah yeah um as best as you can again description of the dog where you live or the center from the area that the dog disappeared to uh -huh. if you live in the country and you have like crossroads do something along those lines um collar color how they should reach you and you always have to have somebody monitoring that typically not you because you're busy doing the work of trying to find your dog. You're going to post that to neighborhood groups. You're going to post that. There's a group called Lost Dogs. It is a Facebook group. Oh. And they have volunteers and representatives in almost every state. So you create the Lost Dog profile, upload the picture to it, and then they send that out. Whether you love your humane society and your animal control or not is irrelevant at this point. You yeah. need to reach out. Yeah. You know, maybe Fluffy went over to the neighbor's house and the neighbor kid let him in the door and they've called because they were like, uh, yeah, I'm new to the neighborhood and this dog got yeah. into my house. Yeah. Always call them and call your police department. These officers are out paroling. Oh, yeah. Most officers love pets. Uh-huh. So they can keep their eyes out as well. And it's good to have that non-emergency number to your police department to call. And, and especially if you, you'd be surprised how kind they are uh, oh, because absolutely. they are your neighbors. They are in your neighborhood and they can, they can do that. I know that they've done that before. Absolutely. Uh, more dogs are found at night by police officers. Yeah. Right. Cause they're driving and they see the eyes glow. And yeah. they'll pull over and pause and be like, oh, hey, Fluffy, you want to hop in my car? Come on in. Yeah. Um, so, yes, you, you always want to call your police department. 
now let's say overnight has passed. It's now the next day. No sign of fluffy. Yeah. You're going to go to your local Walmart, Target, what have you, and buy, I usually tell people 20 fluorescent uh, poster boards, bright yellow, bright green, bright pink. Then you want the giant Sharpie marker and you need to figure out how you're going to stake these posters into the ground. So a lot of times I have old uh, political signs uh-huh. that we use. Yeah. So on your poster board, you're going to write lost dog, a brief description, white, fuzzy, 35 pounds, lost on date and the phone number to call. I usually add in there, do not chase. Yeah. Yeah. And then call and then your phone number. Picture. If you you have a good enough one. And again, these are poster boards. So we're nice and big because here's the deal. People are driving. Yeah. You need to make it obvious that there is a lost dog in the area. That's why the big Sharpie, big Big bold letters, big bold letters, you know, think back to cheerleaders in high school, making all those poster boards, right? Keep it short and simple. I don't want a biography of fluffy is 13% Chihuahua, 10% (laughs) white fluffy dog. Yeah. Um, And you don't want to wrap those on poles. They need to be freestanding. Okay. So if you don't have some old yard signs to attach them to, I usually tell people get some cardboard to put on the back side, uh-huh. you know, something with some stability. Yeah. Uh, you can use garden stakes. You can use paint sticks. Yeah. You, know, you can get yeah. those free at the hardware store. Oh yeah. And then you can staple or nail that to this cardboard and poster board. If it's going to rain, get some clear garbage bags and put over there. And you want to start a minimum of a mile away from your home. Yeah. In every direction. Yeah. Because although Fluffy might have started going south, something might have scared Fluffy and now she's going east. Mm -hmm. And you want to do a one mile radius. And then from there, so I usually do 10 signs in the one mile and then I do 10 signs two miles out. And you want to start in that general area. Uh, Put Fluffy's bed outside, put your clothes outside. Yeah. Dogs can smell up to 10 miles away. Oh, so by putting these familiar smells outside is helpful. Now, let's say you get the call and there's been a sighting. Great. Pick up your signs and start reposition them from that sighting. Same concept. And you need to drop clothes and the dog bed where that sighting happened. Okay. Good idea. If possible, if you're in the country. Yeah. And you have access to a trail cam, that's always pretty nice. Oh, yes. Because you can add some food to that site. It's called a bait site. Uh We're baiting your dog back in. Some dogs will stay in that flight mode for a significant period of time. Um, Typically, it's your husky. Uh Uh (laughs) Your dogs that enjoy the outdoors. Yes, that can stay outside. Correct. Yep, yep. Um, so, so you reposition based on the sightings, reposition your signs again, go in that circle. And then what happens is you start getting calls and you realize really where your dog is hanging out. And then you can start kind of scoping in. Um, we, the longest we've had a dog out on the run is eight days. And, uh, we actually, same thing. The dog was from a hoarding situation. So it didn't really care about people. Uh huh. It was a husky mix. <laughs> uh-huh. <Yeah>. Yes. <laughs> and it was running the bike trail in our bluff region. Okay. And it would travel. I mean, as the crow flies, maybe four or five miles a day. Yeah. As we drove, it would be a 30 minute drive. Yeah. But yeah, it was running up and down this bike trail area. Because they can run. They can really run. They do the idea to run. (laughs) Yes. And um, 
the people had been hiking and as they were loading up their car, oh. somebody else had slammed a trunk and it spooked the dog and the dog oh. pulled and off the leash went. Dragging a six foot leash for eight days was wow. incredible. Like we kept thinking the dog was going to get hung up somewhere. Um, so when you're in that type of situation, right, it's multiple days, but you're getting sightings, you're getting calls of sightings. We would bring out other dogs that this dog was familiar with Ooh. and we would walk that area as much as possible. Again, laying scent, laying scent to memory trick this dog into being like, oh, this is where I should be. I know this smell. Mm -hmm. We had four bait sites set up. And when we do our bait sites, we use a plastic crate bottom, not the top, just the bottom. Yeah. We put in scent from home and food. And when I say food, I don't mean just regular kibble. We would put some regular kibble in there. And every morning we were putting in sausage biscuits from McDonald's. And every evening we were putting in hamburgers. Yeah. Something really smelly, really special. Really smelly and really special. And then we had trail cams. So we could see if there was a pattern of what time the dog was coming in. Plus we were creating a pattern for the dog by always coming and putting these special treats in at a certain time of day. Yeah. So we knew the dog was coming to the site at about 8 p.m. And so we had mom, it was actually on Mother's Day, day eight, go sit at the crate at the bait station at 6 p.m. And the key is just to sit there. Don't yeah. call the dog's name. Just sit there on a blanket yeah. from home. And if the dog comes up, don't reach for it. Don't try and grab it. Again, let the dog come to you. So she just sat there and uh, she said she was perusing Facebook and she just started talking. And the dog slowly walked up to her and just laid down right next to her. Oh. And she hooked the leash up. Yeah. Now that same scenario that I just gave you over the course of eight days has also happened in our two-day dogs missing and our three-day dogs missing. Yeah. yeah. Same scenario. Doesn't matter length of time, but the same concept. Um, we helped a lady who had an Aussie mix. She had just driven it up from Texas from rescuing it. Yeah. Yeah. As she was taking it into the house, it slipped the collar and took off running. So not familiar with the area. Oh my, yeah. Elderly woman. It's not like she could go running after it. Uh, we got the call the day after the dog went missing to assist. And yeah, so right then we started with the poster boards because we had no mm -hmm. idea where the dog was. Mm -hmm. And within a couple hours of putting up the poster boards, we got a call. The dog was hanging out in uh, a subdivision. And so we were in the middle of setting up the bait site and we saw the dog come out of the woods. So we handed mom a leash and a package of hot dogs. And we said, just walk, don't walk towards the dog. We want you to walk parallel. And once you are past where, where the dog is, stop and sit down. And this may take an hour. This may take five hours. We don't know. Yeah. So she just went, she sat down. Now, mind you, they had driven from Texas up to Wisconsin. So they had spent several yeah. days together in the car yeah. bonding. Yeah. Same thing. The lady sat down and was just talking to the dog. Dog is a good 20 feet away from her. Dog slowly walks up, sits down next to her. She hooks the leash up. And two hours later, she comes walking out of the woods with the dog. So it's, it's a process that you cannot rush. You have to have patience and that is super hard. Yeah. It's your dog that's missing. You want to run you, up and grab it. <laughs> you love them. You want, you're worried about them. There is that maternal instinct we have for our pets. Absolutely. And you have to bottle that up and stick it down <sighs> in your gut and just wait. And it is so painful. And I've never heard of the concept of bait sites. That really, to me, makes so much sense. Yes. Uh, if your cat goes missing. You use the litter box. Yeah. Put the litter box outside of your house. And I think with the bait sites, you know, their bed or a bed and something that you know, and your clothes, we're talking dirty clothes, something that smells like you. Absolutely. I, I tell people all the time, you know, sleep, take some towels or rags, put them in your bed. Turn, if you've got a heated blanket, crank it oh, up, yeah. wet onto these pieces yeah. of, of material. So they carry your scent on them. 
Um, and you're, it's always amazing to me how dogs will scent their way back to where they came from. Cause it's something you never want to go through. You never want to go yeah. through losing a pet, you know, but it's good that there is a, that you could tell people a process, you know, of a best case scenario to get your pet back, to bring them yeah. back to you. Absolutely. And it's, you're in panic mode. Yeah. You are yeah. in absolute panic mode. So just know this knowledge stick it in the back of your brain. It's in your toolbox. Um, and you can help friends out with this too. I mean, that, you know, that's just it. It's, it, it's not cookie cutter. However, no. there are steps and based on what the dog is doing, choose your step. Where are you at? Yeah. And, and what's the process to get the dog home? But yeah, it's super hard not to just jump at that dog. Oh my gosh. Oh. Is it super hard? Or to show your elation, to change yes. that vibe about you, to, to, you know, to have that change in energy that yeah. might spook them. I, I watched a, a lady and her kid literally running down a main road, chasing their dog. And so I got, I was in my car, I got out three blocks ahead of them, got out of my car and literally just laid down in the middle of the road. I laid down in the middle of the road and the dog came right up and just sat right next to me. We're like, Oh, somebody that's just yeah. taking a break. I'm going to take a break <laughs> because yeah. to the dog, he was being chased. Yeah. Even though they were his people. Yeah. yeah. First off their tone, they were. Pissed. Oh yeah. Oh, so sure. Was, Let me come here. <laughs> right. And, and again, that's human nature. You're mad. You're trying to, Oh my God, <laughs> let me don't die. You're going to get my yeah. car. So I laid down, the dog came running up, laid down right next to me. I grabbed the dog by the collar sat up and the dog's just panting away. Oh, oh my God. Oh my God. The people come running up. They're like, you just lay down in the middle of the road. I said, yeah. yep. Yeah. I said, and look what your dog did. Yeah. So sometimes going the opposite direction, again, just having that moment of patience uh -huh. to let the dog go. Oh yeah, that's right. Is the most helpful to do if laying down in the road, wasn't going to work then yeah, I was going to open up my car door, but yeah. The dog was running down the middle of the road. So I figured two things would happen. It would literally run into me and lay down or it would veer left or right off the main road. Yeah. So both of those scenarios was what I was shooting for. Either get off the main road because you're running down it mm -hmm. <laughs> or come to me so I can grab a hold of you. Which doesn't feel intuitive when, when you're fluffy who you love or your child's pet is, is going away from you. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, your first instinct is to chase after them. That's what you would do for your human kid. You oh, would yeah. chase after them. Yeah. Um, and yeah. fear sounds just like pissed. It does. Oh, and absolutely. it scares them. They know a trouble. They know the trouble voice. <laughs> absolutely. And and again, there's no foul in that, right? Like it just, it's just what's going to happen. Um, yeah. And it's super, like, you're never going to be running and going, oh, <laughs> no way. In the back of your head, you're going, do oh that my now. God. Um, <laughs> you know, and your kid's in panic mode and you're trying to be brave for them too. And and so, yes, it, it's a very tough situation. Getting in front of the dog yeah. is, like I said, that's usually if Fluffy is running, you are not going to catch up to Fluffy. No, they're fast. I don't care. I mean, unless Fluffy is an obese <laughs> you know massive, maybe. yeah like you know even then like yeah like yeah, they can still go for a ways they can go yeah. they can outrun you yeah so I, that's why i usually say just grab your keys get in your car and go because that is the only way you're going to get in front of fluffy because knowing this it, it unfortunately were to happen you have you have a process you have a way of acting and getting your dog home or even being the person who has their head on their shoulder should it happen to somebody else like you did. Absolutely. And that's really it too. I mean, I completely understand people are in panic mode when I've received the call yeah. and asked to help out. I mean, I've helped out with so many yeah. of these lost dogs that we actually created a group of people and we call ourselves the recovery team. And we have t-shirts made that are fluorescent. So if we have yeah. to wander in the woods, somebody can yeah. keep eyes on us. I've got a magnet for my car because I've been had the cops called on me so many times oh. in neighborhoods <laughs> yeah. um, looking for those eyeballs to peek yeah. out at me Yeah, that, uh, that, yeah, we have, I mean, we, we have a whole kit now um, that we utilize or, or will borrow to people yeah. if they're not near us to help them out. But yeah, just 
being that voice of reason for the person who's going through this and helping walk them through the process, that alone is immeasurable in helping get that dog home. And, you know, with summertime coming up, it, it happens way more than what you expect. Absolutely. But it can also happen in the wintertime too. Yeah. It's just in the summertime, you're in and out more often. You know, it's weather's nice, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, there's grilling going on. Oh, yeah. Animal, I mean, just animals in general, right? Mm-hmm. Again, I used to have hounds. So, oh, there goes a rabbit. Oh, there yeah. goes a squirrel. <laughs> Boom, gone. Yeah. And if I could get in front of that hound so he could hear me and see me better, yeah. I could get him to come to me. And the same thing with people barbecuing down the street. I smell so oh, yeah. many of those. And if you have a, a chow hound, if you have a dog that is totally motivated by food, they might go that way. I mean, they just, you know, they know the smell of good cooking. <laughs> They're going to take advantage of any opportunity they can find. Let's be real. I've had that dog before. <laughs> I mean, you know, if I, if I was next to a chocolate factory, yeah, I might have some troubles. Um, but yeah, so just know that getting information out in as large of a way as possible. Like I said, those poster yeah. boards, if your dog's been missing, yeah. you know, for a period of time that mm-hmm. you need to get a sighting so you know where to look. You can super- probably get all that stuff at like Michael's or somewhere. Michael's, Walmart, Target. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, so you're going to, maybe spend literally maybe spend 25 30 bucks Mm -hmm. and again just getting those out you don't fold the poster boards in half like make it full size and if at all possible make it so if somebody pulls up they can read it from inside their vehicle um you know we we, if you're out in the country you try and put it at intersections or even after a curve because people are going to decelerate uh-huh. after the curve uh-huh. and then right as they're about to accelerate exiting the curve that's where you put that sign so that way they're like oh I'm not going to accelerate just yet because I'm reading the sign and it is big enough for them to see it and that is where we've had the most success in finding lost dogs is those signs how long should somebody look for Fido before thinking oh somebody else adopted him or they got taken to you know who knows where There is no length of time. Um, You know, we hear these stories frequently. Uh, Dogs being on the run for months. Uh, So the the Lost Dogs group, um, there's another group called the Retrievers. And they, again, are also nationwide. You can find them on Facebook. And they spent six months baiting a dog in and finally trapped it. And just like my eight day scenario, the owner went, slept out on a cot in the middle of a field and whoop, dog came up, laid down right next to him. He reached down, put his hand on the dog's collar. Six months they spent wow. trying to get this dog to come in. Yeah. How do you know if your dog might be a runner? Might get spooked. Can this happen to any dog? It can happen to any dog. It, it truly, truly can. Um, again, my Frenchie's a demo dog and I have gotten arrogant a few times and oh yeah, we're fine off leash over at the neighbor's house. Yep. Mm-hmm. The neighbor, they don't have the, the latch on their screen door. So uh-huh. it slams shut. Yeah. yeah. Slammed, spooked him. Dog went running out of the backyard into the front yard. Now I'm thankful my dog ran to my front door because she knew that's yeah. where safety was, was to come inside the yeah. house. But yeah, she could have taken off. Oh. Should you ever practice loud noises and having them come to you? You should. And that is something that's kind of fun to do for lack of, <laughs> <laughs> for lack of a better, better thing. Um, so you can download thunderstorms and all that kind of stuff onto your phone. And I tell people, you're cooking dinner, hit the little button, thunder, you throw a piece of chicken across the other side of the room, find it, good, right? So that way they're getting used to that. Um, There are CDs that you can buy on Amazon that will play classical music and then a loud banging or a siren and then go right back to classical music. So it counter conditions them of, oh, I heard that sound. Oh, nothing bad happened. Oh, cool. Yeah. So 
it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to create a positive experience like throwing them a cookie. However, nothing negative happened when they heard that sound. Yeah. Because I live in a very quiet house. We've, we've talked about that before. My house is very quiet and they could easily get spooked. So it's good to know that there's something out there that I might be able to condition them to a loud boom, those types of noises that may spook them. Yep. And whether it's uh, urban training sounds or rural training sounds, all of the above. Um, you know, again, we, we kind of talk about this at every, every uh, session. You have to be your pet's advocate. Yeah. That is yes. your responsibility as an animal owner. Do not take them to firework displays. They do not need to go to festivals. Yeah. That is about you. That's not about them. They don't need to go to the flea market. That's <laughs> about you. That's yeah. not about them. Yeah. Now the flip side, service dogs. Those dogs are conditioned to handle those scenarios. When you're at the flea market, are you watching your dog or are you shopping for stuff? Yeah. Yeah, I'm shopping. Yeah. So you may not be reading the signs that your dog is stressed out. And that dog might associate then a car ride with going to the flea market and being stressed. So then eventually it doesn't want to go in the car. Yeah. Because every car ride leads to you stressing your dog out. So there are ripple effects to creating those stressful environments for your pet. Um, so you have to be cognitive of it. I, I cringe a lot of times when I see people not being their pet's advocate. Mm -hmm. Got myself in trouble a few times because <laughs> my mouth gets ahead of me. But well, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, your, your dog does not understand when that firework goes off. Your dog no. does not understand when it hears the fire truck go by. Nope. And you have to think that tone that that fire truck makes, that ear piercing sound, Oh, it's got to be way. Worse. Yeah. They have way better hearing than we do. Yeah. Way better hearing like that to them must sound like nails on a chalkboard. Uh huh. Uh huh. And then also I'm thinking of fireworks. There's the smell of the gunpowder. The, the smell of the gunpowder. You know, you, when those big ones go off, you feel that reverberation. Yes. yes. So do they. That's why thunderstorms are also very scary. Yeah. They can feel that reverberation. Mm -hmm. You know, dogs are sensitive to what goes on on the earth because they're the pads of their paws are touching the earth. Yeah. Yeah. You know, people say animals can always sense before a tornado and an earthquake and those things because mm -hmm. they can feel it yeah. through the earth's vibration. Yeah. And, and they don't understand it mm -hmm. all the time. So yeah. again, they're at a festival with you. Hey, they just ate some French fries. Some kid had dropped on the ground and all of a sudden boom like yeah. they have no forewarning that that noise yeah. is coming with a thunderstorm they can usually sense that it's coming uh-huh you know they feel but the it still makes it scary <laughs> it still makes it scary doesn't make it any nicer because they know what it's coming yeah. but you know especially when with these loud um you know a car backfiring i mean yeah. a truck you know that makes us jump because uh -huh. we are not anticipating it and i have jumped before and scared yeah. my dog and my dog was not scared before it saw me jump. Absolutely. So I think the conditioning is really important for lots of scenarios. Cause every time after that, it was like years before she was okay in a thunderstorm because I jumped before that for you, you know, cause she, before that she didn't jump. Thunderstorms didn't scare her when I jumped from then on. So I think if had I conditioned her, my jumping would have been nothing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and we know um, just in general conversation again, right? The dogs recognize different tones. What's my yeah. happy tone? What's my oh, not yeah. so happy tone? Yeah. So they're looking for us for direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so we condition that with, hey, every time I talk like this, you uh -huh. get a cookie. Uh huh. Same thing. Every time you hear that sound of a woo, woo, you're getting a cookie or nothing bad happens to you. Yeah. Yeah. Is a great thing to do. We do that for a lot of dogs in our dog school program. Um, at lunchtime, everybody gets put up, they get their frozen uh, pumpkin treat while we play that CD that has the classical music yeah. and then the urban sounds involved. I think that's, you know, that's something I'm going to do because my Violet, she runs a little bit. She, I, th I think she's always had just a little bit of anxiety. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't know if that's who she is or not, but I think for me to be able to, uh, you know, desensitize her a little bit to some of those things is just, is better for her. Absolutely. You're teaching her that it's not a big deal. Yeah. Life is easy. Life is great. These things, eh, not a big deal. Yeah. For Chrissy jumps. Oh, that's just Chrissy. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. There you go. (laughs) She jumps. (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it, it, again, it's sound of a car accident. Yeah. If a dog oh. has been in a car accident, those yeah. noises well, could be oh, yeah. a huge trigger for them. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So the more con- counter conditioning that you can do with noises, smells, mm-hmm. anything like that um, really helps your dog have a healthier mental state. Definitely. What maybe haven't I asked you that we should know? Well, there's always thousands of things. No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so when you have a lost dog, people have asked, what about a lost dog communicator? What about uh, someone who uses a dog to find lost dogs? Oh. I've heard great things and I've heard things didn't transpire. So I can't tell you, yes, hire yeah. one or the other um, or don't hire one or the other. Yeah. Uh, I know an individual whose dog helps find lost dogs. It's that's most beneficial in rural areas where you have. Is it through smell? Woods, woods, woods. Yes, all okay. through smell. Um, and that that has worked, and and then there are other times it has not worked. Yeah. So you know, you you do what's right for you in in the situation. Yeah. When your dog comes back from being lost, you need to immediately flee and tick the dog. So there's oh. a product called Capstar that you want to give them because you have no idea <laughs> what they might've encountered and oh, you do yeah. not want to bring fleas into your home. No. So, um, Capstar, make an appointment with your vet to get your dog dewormed, especially oh. if it's been gone for a period of time. Cause it probably ate some nasty roadkill somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and then even if your animal hates a bath, you need to give it a bath right away. Oh yeah. You need to pull off any ticks. You need to see if there's any wounds on your pet. Um, You need to do a very thorough examination because if there's a wound that you, you know, you're just excited, especially if you have a hairy dog. Oh yeah. And that wound can already be infected, which then several days from now, you're going to find out. And now it's a bigger vet bill and just, it's, Uh it's just a bigger nightmare. Yeah. So you want to bring the dog in, immediately give it a bath, get it cap starred to kill any fleas. Um, after the bath, then do whatever you do as a normal flea and tick preventative and um, call your vet and set up an appointment just to get it dewormed and make sure that it's healthy. After you've done that stuff, you need to make sure the dog is very secure. It might take several weeks for your dog to get over the trauma of being lost. Give it some grace. Yeah. If it seems sketchy around you, it's now cowering. Give it some grace. Give it some time. Yep. Yep. It's readjusting to its normal life. Mm -hmm. And there may be some new noises and things that it's afraid of that it wasn't before it's a little jaunt out into the real world. But yeah, you need to give it some time. You need to really make sure that it's safe and secure. So that way the noises that it used to not mind, like the screen door slamming now freak it out. Yeah. So just understand that your dog has been through a trauma, even though they created the trauma themselves. It's irrelevant, (laughs) right? It's irrelevant. They suffered a trauma. And um, they need a little extra for several weeks. um, How long before you resume your walking schedule? Do you get an extra harness to, you know, something that definitely you can hold on to more than just their collar? You know, what preventative things do you do? Yeah, I always try and do two levels of safety. So I might have a body harness with a leash Um, So I use a waist belt when I walk dogs. So that way one leash is attached to the waist belt. And then the leash that's attached to the collar is the one I'm holding in my hand. Cause I'm a human being and I might trip. Yeah. I might get startled. Yeah. 
um, a random dog runs up on us and mm -hmm. I have to drop the leash to grab this other dog to get it off yeah. my dog. Yeah. Well, if I don't have that second leash, it now my go. dog could take off running. Yes. And not understand I was trying to, to save it. So um, I usually recommend two levels of safety in some way, shape or form. Um, for walking, I prefer a martingale collar on my dog when I walk it. What's that? So it has an extra loop that you attach the leash to. And when the dog pulls, that tightens. So think of, you know, like a choke chain, um, but it only tightens when the dog pulls. And yeah. that way they can't slip out of it. Yeah. My body harnesses, same thing that has that extra loop there. So when the dog pulls, it tightens the harness which then stops them from being able to slip out of them. Yeah. And these are my walking tools. These aren't mm -hmm. my everyday play in the backyard. Yeah. This is for when I'm leaving the house and I need to make sure that I am my animal's advocate and they are safe. Yeah. So those are really um, important pieces to think about. You can still have that beautiful decorative collar you got on Etsy. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, that doesn't need to go away. But yeah, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've tripped, especially I'm in Wisconsin. It's winter. It's slippery. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> and the first thing you want to do is brace yourself with your hands. Well, if I have that leash in my hand, I've now dropped it. Yeah. And now where am I at? Yeah. Um, so yeah. So always two levels of safety and then utilizing tools that your dog can't slip out of. So if you're using a body harness, it needs to fit. If you have a hairy dog, uh, we usually use the two finger rule. So between the, the, not the fur, but between the body of the dog and your harness, it should be snug on your two fingers um, that you can still pull them out, but it needs to be snug. And that's those hairy dogs are the tricky ones because yeah. you're like, oh, it's tight enough. Their fur is tight enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I've almost learned the hard way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And again, when your dog is scared and they're backing out of the oh, harness yeah. Oh, yeah. and then what? Yeah. Um, you know, that's when you see people bear hug and tackle their dog to, to make it so they can't escape. So just make sure everything is nice and tight, um, very fitting. So many of the pet stores, you can take your animal in to make sure you're getting the right size. Yeah, yeah. So, so that way it's, it's going to fit snug and they can help you fit it. Yeah, that, I think that's, that's really important to have that extra level of confidence in yourself that... Uh, that you you can go back on your walks that you are you both feel safe that, you know because if you feel safe then you're projecting that confidence to your dog and and being that leader absolutely and if you've had that almost back out of the collar or the harness experience yeah. you're going to be nervous on the walk yeah and then yeah. you're transferring that mm -hmm. so spend the money yeah it's worth it it's, it's so yeah. worth it it's a small investment yeah um, uh, Freedom no pulls are the harnesses that we typically use because they do cinch up, but there's lots of brands that do, but yeah, the, the kind that cinch up really, that's what you need. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's what and you need. I like the pet stores uh, where I shop, but will let me try it on. Yes. Um, you know, I had to do that for my uh, doggy seatbelt. I had to try it on. Um, it didn't fit. I was able to bring it back, but you know, being able to try on the next one at the store with the dog there is a really awesome thing to do and to get yeah. it done proper you know because yes. i like the the leashes that have the little loop out front so if they run they kind of get turned around yeah i like that and Absolutely. they have to be well fitting not too tight not too loose <laughs> no and that's exactly it and um you know if you're concerned about rubbing or chafing there are other harnesses there that have padding on them. Yeah. Um, you can add a little felt if you so desire uh -huh. um, and make it your own. But yeah, the, and the people that work at, at the pet store specifically, yeah. you know, they know just like buying a pair of jeans, they know what runs a little snug, what uh -huh. runs, you know, a little big. So a medium in one harness might not be the same size in the other harness. So just making sure that um, you have, again that right fit that right size and and it is hard like again I have a French bulldog so she's big in the chest but really tiny in the waist area mm -hmm. so in my head she's a small yeah she's actually a medium yep because of that bigger yeah. chest so it's it's really important that you get that that right fit on the on the dog um, and if you're 
animal wear sweaters, make sure that they have mm -hmm. the hole in the back so you can yeah. take the leash through it. Again, we like to dress our puppy up too. So <laughs> she has lots of clothes. Yeah, um, I but do too. That safety piece is, is super important. You wouldn't let your child, you know, be in an unsafe situation. That's why they have car seats and booster seats. Yeah. Same concept for your pet. Because if you've ever, you know, been in the situation, uh, you know, where your pet's been lost or they've been mm -hmm. hurt or something and, and there was something you could have done, the guilt is unimaginable. Um, or you've had an almost situation. It, it's just that, that nobody needs to feel that. No, and connected. that will live with you forever. I mean, that, that trauma that you just experienced mm -hmm. with your pet lives forever and every time you see a dog um out and about you know you'll relive that trauma yeah i every time i see somebody that is out walking really fast and looking left and looking right and they're not wearing workout clothes i'm like oh my gosh did they lose their dog and i've rolled my window down i hate to bother you did you lose a pet <laughs> oh no i'm just out for a walk oh okay well you're in jeans and a sweatshirt I just thought, you know, and you're scoping the neighborhood i thought maybe you lost your pet um so yeah, I, I, that's the first thing I think but of when I see people in non-workout clothes. That's part of being an empathetic, kind, caring person, part of your community. Yeah, no, I just immediately go, oh my gosh, they lost a pet. <laughs> yeah. Let me, let me jump out of my car and go chase and see what I can find. Yeah, so it's, it's uh, it, once you've had the trauma, you don't get over that. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, so we, we learned some tips some tricks along the way of how to not get them to do that um, for them specifically. But when they take off, you, you need to have an action plan. Yeah. So and follow through on it. And I think the first step of calling a friend, getting them going with you is it is the most important thing. All those steps that, that you gave to us, if you ever have to go through it, will help fluffy get back to you. Fluffy or Fido. Absolutely. Yeah. It's uh it's a great thing to see them reunited. Yeah. And then you go, okay, let's never do this again. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ever do this. Yeah. I had a cat run off once and after eight days, she came back skinny, uh, but she can't, she came back. I think she got stuck in somebody's garage because she was nosy um, while they went away on vacation. It was summer. And I there cried and cried and cried because I don't let my cats out because I don't want them to get ate by something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm, I, I try to be very, very careful, but even as careful as you are, it can happen. And, and being prepared is so important. And the tips you gave are they're spot on, they're right on, and you know, they've worked because you've used them. Yes. Uh, last pre-COVID, I think we did 12 one summer. Oh. 12 different animals and all had success and getting them back home and just a wide range of how, why they got out. Um, mm -hmm. The rural ones are always more complicated mm -hmm. because there's yeah. so many more places to hide and fewer eyes than in an urban environment. Mm -hmm. But utilizing social media um, is, is just very, very important. And now that you've heard the podcast about this, also know not to pass blame oh yeah yeah you need to do too somebody posts oh my dog is lost well what'd you do let it you know oh, yeah. lock your door why'd you let it out right leave um, it why did you leave it alone oh my gosh I feel terrible because that's happened to me and that's exactly it accidents happen yeah, yeah. um if you have kids yeah. there's an uncontrollable piece to the scenario oh yeah so it, it is what it is. Everybody needs a little grace. Mm -hmm. Be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Yeah. And, you know, it is traumatizing and it's, you just don't want to add that to it. And especially with kids. And it's, I think the tips you've given will help us keep our heads on should it ever happen to us. And it also, for me, should I see that happening through my community board? I now have better ways of helping someone. Absolutely. Yeah. Share the tips and tricks. Um, again, when you're in that stressful situation, your mind is not thinking straight. Oh yeah. What do I do next? What do I do next? I have no idea because this has never happened to me before. Offer words of wisdom. Um, you know, go help make poster boards. 
it's not that complicated. It's a very small monetary investment. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so be, be a resource to those who are very much in need at that moment. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, as always, it's a pleasure having you here. Well, thank you. I look forward to our chat next month. Absolutely. June is right around the corner. It is. <laughs> <laughs>